And so, Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge that you, God Almighty, have come among us. And what a joy this Christmas season to be able to remember, to celebrate, to rejoice in who you are, to get just varied biblical perspectives on this coming of God Almighty, Emmanuel, with us. So we pray that this morning as we finish this year as a church together with some friends and folks from around the country and the area who are visiting from out of town, just let us sense your presence. Let us feed on your word. Let us finish this year rejoicing for the gift of Jesus and, and get a vision of what it means to walk into the new year, walking hand in hand with our Savior. Bless this time together, we pray, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. So when is the right time, the proper time, the correct time to pack it all up? When does the tree come down? When do the ornaments get put away? When do you change your playlist and drop the Christmas songs? When do you take, if you've got some dishes with a little bit of holly trimming the edge, when do you put them away? When's the right time? Well, for some people, the answer is December 26th. You know, Christmas is over. The next day, they're packing up. They're, and there's people, they're just, okay, Christmas is over. Everything gets packed up, put away, and they go to bed that night on the 26th, and it's all you would never even know what happened. It was just all, all, some, those people, when they pulled in today in the parking lot and drove through the courtyard and saw the big tree, they thought, what's the tree doing here? Christmas is over. <laughs> There's probably some of you that walked in here and said, what's going on? I mean, Christmas has been done for three days now. You haven't, but, and just so you know, we're doing a cleanup time today at one o'clock. If you want to come back and help us, you're welcome to. Uh, <laughs> and, and that does happen. But for some people, it's, the 20, it's December 26th. For other people, it's January 1st. Right after the, I, I got some amens there. <laughs> I heard some yes, amen, praise Jesus. Uh, but, <laughs> but for some people, it's like, okay, January 1, now it's time. You pack it up, you put it away, and, and, and that's, that's when the manger gets packed up, and everything gets put away. Some people kind of edge their way into January, middle of January, maybe even a little bit into February. And the December 26 people go visit their home, and they're like, didn't you get the memo? Come on now, put, put, you know, but, 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 there's a, but there's a point. There's a point at some point, whatever your time is, when everything gets packed up and put away, where, where Christmas officially, at least in terms of decorations, comes to an end. So if you got an invitation in June to go to a barbecue in someone's backyard, it's a beautiful sunny day, it's June, and, and you walk in their home and their Christmas tree's still up, and it's June. You're kind of, oh, that's interesting. They're really festive. They're hanging in there, you know. This is a, and then you notice that they got the manger scene set up still. And then, and then while you're having like your, you know, your, like your ribs and chicken on the grill, they, they, they say, hey, would you like a glass of eggnog? And you're thinking, nobody told them. <laughs> it's done, right? Uh, there, there's, a, there's some point, I don't know what the exact time is, but uh, it, it's different, different people. There's, there's a point where, where Christmas sort of ends and you move on with the new year and, and new things. What I want to suggest today is that although there is a time to bring down the tree, to pack up the dishes, to, to change your listening tunes a little bit, even there's a time to change some of those things, Jesus is for all year round. Someone say amen. amen. I mean, he's for all year round. And, and the, 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 the festive stuff is great. Enjoy it. But just because you pack stuff away doesn't mean that Jesus gets packed away. When you pack the manger away, you're not packing Jesus away. Jesus is present and glorious all year round. And what we've been learning this Christmas season, at least here at Shoreline, is that, is that to take different perspectives and look at who this Jesus is, you discover that he's the one who leads you all year long. Every day, every moment, Jesus leads you. And, and so, so we learned from Joseph. One of the lessons we learned from looking at Joseph's life is that God's plan is better than ours. And sometimes his plan is hard. I mean, his plan is better than our plan, but sometimes his plan is a challenging plan that stretches us. Do we need to know that year round? Yes. So keep those lessons in your heart. From there we learn that if you make yourself available to God, he will do amazing things through you that you couldn't dream of. I mean, you look at Mary's story. If you can say, I am the Lord's servant, may it be to me as you have said. If we can yield to the will of God, God will do more through us than we can imagine. That's a lesson for every week of the year. Make yourself available to God and watch what he does in and through you. 
from the wise men. And this is one of the lessons I've really been blessed by this Christmas season. Think, from the wise men, we learn that God still speaks in interesting ways. I mean, he led the wise men to Jesus with a star, and he led them home a different route through a dream. God works in unique ways. God speaks in different ways. Do we need to be reminded all year long that the Jesus we follow surprises us and we should be paying attention to follow his will? What do you think? All year long, that's what we do. And then from the shepherds, I love the shepherd's story. We learn that God shows up in the flow of normal life. I mean, the shepherds were third shift workers. I mean, it's the middle of the night. They're taking care of sheep. Most of them are asleep. Most of them are down. And they're sitting there kind of, kind of tired, just, just doing their job. And an angel shows up and then a whole sky full of angels. And God speaks. The Christmas story tells us that God shows up when he wants to in surprising times. Be ready for God to show up all the time. We look through the eyes of the angels and their perspective. And we heard them declare that he is Savior. He is good, the good news you're looking for. He's the joy you want. He's the peace your soul longs for. Do we need to be reminded about the joy and the good news and the love and the peace of Jesus just four weeks a year? No way. All year long. We looked at God the Father's perspective. And we were reminded that this Jesus... In our little manger scene, this is from our house. He's just a little, we got this, we got this actually in Bethlehem. This little set. And, uh, but we're reminded that this baby who was born is actually Emmanuel, God with us. That's mind-blowing. That's staggering. And so you can pack up the manger, you can't pack up Jesus. Amen. Right? And we're going to walk in his presence and walk in his joy and walk in his glory all year long. We looked at all these different perspectives, but here's my question to today. How do you view Jesus? What images come to your mind? Well, we've heard from the shepherds. We've heard from the wise men. We've heard from the angels. We've heard from God the Father. We've heard from Mary and Joseph. What goes on in your heart? What goes on in your mind when you think about Jesus? I hope it's bigger than a baby in a manger. Do we celebrate that God incarnate came among us and was born in a manger? Absolutely. But there's more to the story. This same Jesus who was born in the manger, God with us, lived a life with no sin. But 33 years after he was born, he died on the cross for our sins. He took our shame. He took our punishment. And he died in our place. And three days later, he rose again in glory. Then he ascended to heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us now. The same Jesus born in the manger is the Jesus who intercedes for us right now. And we've got to have this big picture of Jesus, not this, okay, Christmas is over, move on to other things, but what does it mean to walk with Jesus throughout the year? When you ask people, well, what do you say about Christmas? What's Christmas really about? This Christmas season is kind of coming to a close here as, as we're wrapping up. What, you know, what do people say? I grew up in a home where Christmas was lots of things, but it wasn't Jesus. There was no Jesus in our Christmas. We didn't read the Christmas story. We didn't have prayers. We didn't go to church. That just wasn't my family. And so, so for me growing up, it was lots of things that it is, I think, for many people still today. You know, some people say, well, Christmas is about family. It's, Christmas is about being with family whether you want to or not. All right? Enjoying your family or tolerating your family, but you're going to be with family. That's what Christmas is about. It's about time off from school, from work. It's about vacation. For some people, Christmas is ending. I'm going back to work. I'm going back to school. And it's like, oh, another year. Because all Christmas is is time off. For some people, it's traditions. It's Santa, reeds, candy canes, trees, eggnog, mistletoe. Although in some places, mistletoe is illegal now. It's a triggering uh, plant. You know, people see it. They think of kissing and they can't. I don't know. But uh, there's not... Have you noticed there's not as much mistletoe because it could become a lawsuit? Um, but uh, just my observation. Um, but, but for some people, it's like all these different traditions. And that's, that's fun. That's nice. and, and, and those kind of come to a close. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't come to a close. For some people, it's about giving and receiving gifts. For some people, Christmas is really about this part of the story. For some people, Christmas is just the baby in the manger. And it's there. Is this part of the Christmas story? Absolutely. Is the baby in the manger the whole Christmas story? Oh, there's so much more. And when we get the whole story, 
and we carry it in our hearts and embrace it, then, then we walk through our year walking in the presence of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter one. Colossians is one of the letters written in the early church. It's in the New Testament where uh, the, the apostle Paul is writing to the church at Colossae and, and he's talking about who Jesus is. Uh, we, we've looked at Christmas through the perspective of, of lots of different points of view. I want to look at it through the Apostle Paul's perspective. The Apostle Paul was a hater of Jesus, was a destroyer of the church, was having Christians killed for their faith, and then he met Jesus, and everything changed in his life. And when he met Jesus, he saw the fullness of who Jesus is. Yes, Emmanuel God with us, born in a manger, but also the King of kings and Lord of lords. So listen to these words from Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. And as you listen to this picture of Jesus, try to imagine anyone packing him up on December 26th or January 1st and putting him in a box. This Jesus cannot be contained. The Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes these words. The Son, Jesus, the one born in the manger. The Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth. Things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created. I love this. All things have been created through him and for him. Isn't that powerful? All things have been created through him. He's the source of their creation. And for him, he is the end of their creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things are sustained. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Jesus. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now that's a perspective on Jesus. And if you know it's true, if you believe it, you can't pack that up and put it away till next Christmas. That, that's just life. That's so big, so glorious, so powerful. So what would the Apostle Paul tell us about Christmas and about Jesus? I mean, if if the Apostle Paul, through, through what he writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, what would he say to help us understand what does it mean to walk with Jesus all year long? To, to yes, put away the decorations, but not put away Jesus. I think he would tell us this, that he is the image of God. He'd say, this Jesus is the image of the invisible God. When a child is born, Oftentimes, parents, family members, friends will make observations. Oh, she's got her mother's eyes. Have you ever heard something like that? Oh, she's got her mother's eyes. You can see it really, really young. Child starts to grow up a little bit. Boy, this little one has, has their dad's kind of, kind of quiet, calm disposition. They can see, like their dad this way. They're like their mom this way. But Jesus is different than that. He is the perfect reflection of the Father. In in the Gospel of John, in the 14th chapter, Jesus himself says this. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus says, if you see me, don't don't say show us the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, right? You've seen the Father. Later on, he says, because I and the Father are one. It's part of the mystery of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You know, just, just bound together. One being revealed in three persons. In Hebrews chapter one, powerful text. At the very beginning, we read this. The sun, this is verse three of Hebrews one. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Let me read that again. Hebrews one three says the sun, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That's Jesus. When you encounter Jesus, you encounter God Almighty. To have seen Jesus is to see the Father. That's what the Apostle Paul would remind us. He would say this, this Jesus is the creator of all things. Everything we imagine or can see, every, God, he, Jesus, through Jesus, everything was created. The stars, the heavens, the expanse, their beauty, the, just the, the massive, unthinkable expanse of all that, 
through Jesus, it was all made. Every creature that walks or crawls on this planet made by Jesus in their beauty and their creativity and their strangeness, he made it all. Every fish and critter under the sea, most that we'll never see, made through the very word of God through Jesus Christ. Sherry and I had a chance about a month ago to dive in the Great Barrier Reef off of Australia, a once in a lifetime experience. But just to look at all the colors and the creatures and all that was there, and to realize that most of those, most people will never see, but God said, I'm making it anyways. Just beautiful, staggering, incredible. He is the creator of all things. Get that in your heart. Get that in your mind. He is the sustainer of all things. He is the one who sustains us. I am absolutely convinced that when I see Jesus face to face, at some point in the, in the, in the eternity that we'll, we'll spend celebrating in his presence, I think we'll get a picture of all the ways that God was at work in this life that we never saw. All the ways he sustained us. Have you ever, have you ever gotten in your car after work or after being out somewhere, you know, day or nighttime, but you're, you get in your car, you start driving, and all of a sudden you pull in your driveway five minutes later, 20 minutes later, and you have this thought, I can't remember anything that happened from the time I left there to got here. Have you ever had that happen where you realize, I was driving, I think it was like an autopilot, but I don't remember, I just was, my brain, I was singing the song, I was thinking about this, I don't remember a thing. How many times did God sustain your life? I think about my junior high years. There's gotta be like 127 ways I could have killed myself in junior high, the, way, the things I did, the insane things. We would jump our bikes over things, we would jump over bikes over other kids, and we didn't even wear helmets. Um, <laughs> I remember, there, I remember on the playground when I was a kid, when I was in junior high, it's kind of like you know, older grade school, junior high, they had these chin-up chin up bars, these, these metal bars. There was like one about this high and then one higher and then one even higher. And they were for chin-ups, but they were over pavement. There was not like pads and foam or bark. It was just over pavement, right? And I remember there was this thing called a cherry drop. Where, I don't know if any of you did this, where we, we would hang by, our, like by the, the crook in our legs here, upside down, and you'd use your arms to start swinging. So your, your legs are up here, your head's down, the cement's below you. You start swinging, and when you thought you were far enough, you'd let your legs go, and you'd flip out, and you'd land on your feet. You're know, like on the 20th try. The first 19 tries, you land on your face, or you land on your back, right? And then after you mastered the cherry drop, you did the death drop. And the death drop is where you would sit on the, you'd climb up, and you'd sit on top of the bar here, and above the cement, and then you'd fall, I'm not recommending this to the kids, but I'm just telling you, this is what we did. And then you'd fall backwards, and as you fell backwards, you hooked your legs, you caught the bar, you swung, you let go, and you landed on your feet, was the, was the theory. Did anybody else do these things? Okay, I see that hand, praise the Lord, brother, sister, I see that hand, okay. Um, how did any of us stay alive? By the grace of God, thank you. Um, how many ways, how many, I think of Sherry and I in our early years of marriage, how many weeks did we just have nothing, no money, nothing left, and God somehow showed up and carried us through? Over and over and over and over. And all the countless times we've never noticed. Paul says, he sustains all things. We don't even know how much God has sustained us, what he's brought us through. We get glimpses, but one day we'll know, and we'll be in awe again of his glory. Paul would say he's supreme over all. He, that, that, that he is the Lord of all, the ruler of all, the leader of all. And, and you know what? I am a, I'm actually a fan of honoring people that are in leadership, whether, whether they're, whether they're in, in a public office, whether, people who are in, in the first responders that are protecting us. I'm, I'm a fan of honoring those people who work hard, people in education. I just think that people that are working hard, they're in roles of leadership to honor them. And that's great. I honor those people. But there's only one I bow down to and I worship. And he is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the ruler of all. His name is Jesus. And Paul says, that's who we're talking about. That's this one born in the manger. That's this one who bore our sins on the cross. That's the one who rose again. That's the one who ascended to the right hand of the Father. That's the one who intercedes for you right now and is with you. That Jesus. Paul would say he's completely divine. He's fully God. Paul wants us to understand that this Jesus is God in human flesh. And he had to be fully divine and fully human. 
all brought together in one person because as being fully human, he could take our sins and bear our shame and pay the price for us as being fully human. And being fully divine, he was big enough to pay the infinite price that we owed to an infinite God. As fully man, he bore our sins. As fully God, he had the power to pay for our sins. And that Jesus, fully man, fully God, hard for our minds to comprehend, but absolutely what the word of God teaches and what the apostle Paul is saying. Paul would say to us, understand that this Jesus makes peace through his blood shed on the cross. The peace we long for, the peace we need can be found in only one place in the sacrifice of Jesus. Because that gives us peace with God and that can allow us to have peace with other people. And that peace is found in Jesus Christ. And so when you look at all of that, all that Jesus is, this is, part of, this is Paul's version of the Christmas story, this Jesus who came. We discover that the manger, the cross, and the empty tomb are inextricably connected. That that we can't just look at the manger scene and say, oh, what a cute little Jesus. Look at that little baby in the manger. That's not enough. He's the one who lived the perfect life, who died and gave his life for us, who rose again, and who will come again. That's Jesus. And Paul wants us to have that bigger picture. As I was thinking about this, as I was preparing this sermon and thinking and praying about this, what came to, one of the things that came to my mind was a, one of the great creeds of the church called the Athanasian Creed. I had a couple people come up and ask me how to spell it afterwards, but if you just do Christian creeds and then you start spelling A-T-A, Ath, it's Athanasius, who actually wasn't the one who wrote it, but he's, it's attributed to him. But the Athanasian Creed, from the 6th century till now, Christians have used this as a way to kind of express the complexity of what the Bible teaches. This isn't, I'm, what I'm going to read you in a moment is not from the Bible. This is God's people together trying to express in words what the Bible teaches about, about who Jesus is. The Athanasian Creed has two parts. The first part is about the, tr- the nature of God as Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but one God. The second half of the Creed is about Jesus Christ being fully divine and fully human, bound together. But I want to read two little pieces from the second half of this creed, of the Athanasian Creed. And just, it's not going to be on the screen, just listen and just try to get your mind around what this is, trying to summarize what the Word of God says about Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man. And, and it's written this way, that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and human equally. He is God from the essence of the Father, begotten before time. And he is human from the essence of his mother, born in time. Completely God, completely human, with a rational soul and human flesh. And then a little bit later in the creed, it says this. Although he is God and human, yet Christ is not two, but one. He is one, however, not by his divinity being turned to flesh, but by God taking to himself humanity. He is one certainly not by the blending of his essence, but by the unity of his person. For just as one human is both rational soul and flesh, so too the one Christ is both God and human. There's a lot there. But but the, the point is this, that this Jesus who came fully God and fully man, as man could bear our sins and as God could pay for our sins. And you bring those together. Man, that kind of God you can't pack up in a box at the end of December. That kind of God has to lead your life every moment of every day, all year round, till he comes again or till we go to be with him. And I hope and pray for you this Christmas season, you walk with him with that kind of passion of saying, I want to walk with God in who he is and be in the presence of Jesus. Our theme for surely next year, the whole year, our theme is going to be more like Jesus. That's going to be our theme. How do we become more like this Jesus? It's going to be an amazing year at surely. But but there's some questions. This, This Christmas season, as people enjoy different aspects of Christmas, as people gather with families, do different things, I think people start asking some questions. And maybe there's questions on your heart and your mind. And I just want to reflect on a couple of questions that may be going through your mind this season of the year. Some people are asking this question. Is there more than this? You know, vacation's going to be over. The gifts are you know, done. Stuff's going to put it back to life. Is there more than just living this life? And, and when you understand who Jesus is and what we've experienced this last month about this one who came, you discover this. Is there more than this? Yes. There's a whole spiritual world. There is, there is a real heaven, and there is a real hell, and there's a real spiritual world. There, there, there's more going on than meets our eye. 
Is there more than this? Yes, there's love beyond description. If you're longing for love, looking for love, is there more than what I'm experiencing? And you haven't met Jesus yes, yet, then the answer is yes, there's more than whatever you've experienced. Because he loves you like no one else can. Is there more than this? Yes, there's cleansing from sin. Jesus can wash away all of our sins because he paid the price on the cross. Is there more than this? Yes, there is eternal life. And God opens his arms and invites anyone who will come to him. What Jesus did on the cross, the price he paid as God with us was big enough to pay for all of our wrongs. We just have to receive the gift and accept it. Is there more than this? When you walk with Jesus, you discover that there's actually hope, not just for eternity, there's hope in this life. Even with its challenges, even with the problems we face, there is hope in Jesus, even in the toughest times of life. What many people are asking is, is there a family that gets along and loves each other? There's people that have been with family in this last week, and they said, I did it, did the family thing. But man, there's always tension and conflict. Is there a family where there's true love and caring for another? And I would say, yes, there is in the body of Christ, in the church. There's a family that God has made and designed to give us a place to belong. Now, is the church perfect? No. Just like your earthly family's not perfect, the family of God's not perfect. You know why the, family, you know why the church isn't perfect? Here's the answer. Because we're part of it. Are you following me? I'm part of it. If you find a perfect church, please don't join it. Because it will no longer be perfect. You know? I'm not perfect. I've been a pastor a long time. I'm not perfect. So I'm not talking about a perfect church, but I'm talking about a family where we love each other. We walk together. We walk in community as the body of Christ. That's a gift from God. I remember as a young Christian, I was, I was part of a church of about over 10,000 people down in, in Garden Grove, California, here in Southern California. Part of this church, I became a Christian in the youth group. And they also had, with, with all the youth, all the kids in the youth group called Big Church. Well, then there's Big Church, this big glass building, big glass cathedral place. And, and they, but we all were a youth group. We didn't go to Big Church. But when I became a Christian, I thought I should be part of the family because everyone I hung around with were all my age. So I started going on Sunday evenings and I started going to big church, but nobody wanted to go with me. I went by myself. And I, and I experienced just being with grown-ups and worshiping Jesus. And at the end of every service, and I'd always sit kind of like in the middle, a few rows back, and at the end of every service, they'd have a time where they'd say, if you want to come forward, you can come and kneel up at the altar area and pray for, pray for any needs you have. Well, the altar area was like this hard, it was beautiful, really hard marble, so it wasn't comfortable at all, but, there, but, but you know, maybe 50, 100 people would go up and kneel and pray. So what I'd always do is I'd always say to the person on my right and my left, I'd say, is there anything I can pray for you for? Is there anything I can pray for you for? Then I'd go up and I'd pray. And so I remember one Sunday evening, I, the, the woman to my left, I, I said, is there anything I can pray for you for? And she said, I just found out I have cancer, and it's not a good report. And I said, what's your name? And she said, my name's Arvella. So I said, okay, and I went up and I prayed for her. And then one of my friends, like the next, next day or two, said, so did you go to big church? I said, yeah. And they said, did you do your prayer thing? I said, I pray. well, what would you pray for? And I said, well, this one lady... Um, named Arvella. She has cancer. So I've been praying. I prayed for her Sunday. I've been praying for her since. And they said, Arvella Schuler? I said, I don't know. And I didn't even know that the pastor of the church was Robert Schuler. And, this was, and they said, well, she, his wife just found out she had cancer. And I thought, what a privilege to sit as a 16 year old kid and to have this woman who just got probably the worst news of her life entrust to me, a kid, will you pray for me? That's the church. Imperfect, yes, but glorious and beautiful and a gift, yes. This, this is part, there, there is a family, imperfect, but learning to love each other, and that's the church. We're part of that family, a, a, a family of sacrificial friendships where we give for each other and to each other, a family of common belief. Sherry and I get to travel around the world for Organic Outreach International. We do stuff with Compassion International. We've been in different countries with that, and everywhere we go, we meet Christians, and they believe in Jesus. They hold to the Bible. We're a family globally that believes in this God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit who loves us, who calls us his own. And there's something glorious about being part of the church. I hope this Christmas season you push beyond tradition to really walking with Jesus. Another question I think people are asking, what's behind all these Christmas traditions? I mean, why, why, why all these traditions? I think if you don't drill down and get to what it's about, it can just be fluff. But when you drill down, you discover that Christmas is about ultimately that God came among us, Emmanuel, God with us. It's about God saying, I have a gift to give you, the life of my own son. 
Receive that gift. It's about you saying to the world, I have a gift to share with you. I just got the best gift ever. His name is Jesus. Can I tell you about him? And it's about walking in his joy, his peace, and his hope every day, not just at Christmas time. Man, I need joy, peace, hope, and good news year round. Anybody else? I mean, and Jesus offers us that. What many people are asking is who is this baby Jesus? This, this one born in the manger. If we leave it just Jesus in the manger, and if we, if we pack, pack it away next week or next month, whenever it is, we're missing. That this one born in the manger is Emmanuel, God with us year round. He is Savior to wash our sins away. He's the closest friend you will ever have if you'll let him be your friend. He is the leader that you need every day of your life. Don't pack him away. He is the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is everything. And so I want to close our service, and I want to close our last time together as a congregation with a passage from the book of Revelation. And I want to, this is a contrast. We've been looking at Jesus born in the manger when he came to this earth. I want to read a passage about when he comes again. It's a different picture, but it's the same Jesus. Now he comes in judgment and justice for all the sin and all the injustice that needs to be made right. He comes to make everything right because the one born in the manger is the one who will come again. And though the picture may look different, it's the same Jesus. So just let your, let your heart and mind hear these words. This Jesus who wants to walk with you all year long. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and true. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword which strikes down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This one born in the manger is the king of kings and lord of lords. This humble one born will come to make, to bring justice and make right all that has been wrong. And you can't put them in a box and pack them up. So when you pack up your Christmas stuff, just say to yourself, okay, I might be packing up, taking down a tree and packing up different decorations, but Jesus, you're with me all year long because you cannot be packed up, you cannot be put away, and you don't fit in a box. You made the box in all the universe. Lord Jesus, our prayer as we come to the end of this year together is that we will experience you more in this coming year than we ever have before. That we will know that you are the tender, gentle child born in a manger, Emmanuel, God with us, and we will know that you are the coming King of kings and Lord of lords and everything in between, which is our lives. Be with us, lead us, guide us, fill us with your spirit. Give us boldness to live for you, to share your good news. Help us model what it means to become more and more like Jesus. May this new year be a fresh beginning of spiritual growth and walking with you for each one of us and for anyone who does not yet know you, Lord, may this be the time that they say, Jesus, I need to know you. I need to receive you. I need your grace and forgiveness. I need to open the gift that you give me of yourself. Lord, we pray for your blessing and power as we walk into a new year hand in hand with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said?